let's now consider Alfred Adler associated with birth order. I always love this picture. I think it's so fun. So if you're familiar with the effects of birth order, that of what our firstborns more often like, middle children, our youngest, or only children, this work originating with Alfred Adler. Let's briefly consider some of the major characteristics that often are associated with each birth order position, and you can see if you match your position uh, or not. When I think of the middle child, I always think of the Brady Bunch, and I always think of Jan complaining, Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. The middle child is in the middle and often feels like they don't get their fair share of attention. And I asked my class, do you think that's real or in their minds? Well, it's real. Uh, loss in the middle. For example, if you have a family photo album and you're the middle child, or there is a middle child in the family, take a look at the number of pictures that have the middle child alone. Often the first child has a full album or two. The middle child often has just a few shots, often with other children. And middle children get the hand-me-down clothes. I hope their older sibling was the same sex. They get the hand-me-down toys. So a lot of times they feel like they don't get their fair share of attention, and they're right. Psychologically, uh, they often are very socially skillful children because they have to navigate younger, younger children and older children and friends of their siblings. So often their asset is strong, strong social skills. On the downside, sometimes they feel driven to do things to stand out, to get parental attention. That might involve piercing, uh, getting arrested, changing religion, but sometimes they're driven to do things to stand out. And it's really not their fault, it's their parents' fault. If you think of the youngest child, you're thinking of the baby. And often the baby is always the baby. So they're the baby at 20, they're the baby at 40, they're the baby at 63. The baby is used to being taken care of. So whereas the first child was pushed and pushed to do their own things, to take care of themselves, to dress themselves, a lot of times by the time we get to the youngest, it's easier to say somebody in the family, take care of so-and-so, dress them, take care of them. So the youngest is often used to being taken care of. The youngest is not stupid. The youngest knows how to play the system. Let's consider the only child. Which position do you think they're most similar to? If you say firstborn, you're correct, because every firstborn is an only child for a while until the other siblings show up. So as the firstborn tend to be high achievers, so is the only child. As the firstborn have often social skill challenges, we'll say, so often does the only child, but a different set of social challenges. You learn a lot of life lessons from siblings, how to compromise how to share, how to forgive after a fight, and many more things. Now, if you consider who you date, firstborn, middle child, youngest or only, you might want to consider the birth order. Birth order. The firstborn, well, you might play second fiddle to their job, their achievers. Middle child, very social. So the middle child might come with a posse, so you might want to sometimes have dinner by yourselves, go to the movie by yourselves, but the middle child often has a posse. The youngest is used to being taken care of, so you might have to do things for them that you think that maybe they should do for themselves. The only child, again, with those particular social challenges, they might expect you to do, say, all the compromising, whether it's where you go to dinner or where you move or which apartment you get. They're used to being able to make decisions. There is no other children to compromise with. They can be grudge holders. They never had to fight and learn the skills of making up. So you might have to do a lot of compromising and making up when the fight really wasn't your fault. So again, consider the birth or position of the person you date or maybe even marry. It could have an effect. So we've been looking at personality. We start with the historical perspective of Hippocrates. And we so far have looked at two modern perspectives, that of trait theory and the psychodynamic theory. Let's look at another modern perspective of personality, humanistic view. We know much of this content from earlier in the course. Can you remember the two major theorists? No, they're not the B people. Remember the B people are behaviorists. Hint, their pictures are on the bottom. On the left, you see Abraham Maslow, and on the right, you see Carl Rogers. In terms of key concepts, well, Freud was a half-empty sort of person, uh, seeing people as sexual and aggressive beings. 
The humanistic crowd are the glass half full people, human beings as fundamentally good. Part of this is our drive to self-actualize, to move towards our better selves, to self-improve. Maybe college is part of that internal drive to be better. The humanistic view is often associated with a hierarchy of needs. I often ask my class, have you had hierarchy of needs in a non-psychology class? And often I have students who have it in a wider variety of courses, these hierarchy of needs, everything from nutrition to sometimes business and many more classes. So on the next page, we'll consider the hierarchy of needs proposed by one Abraham Maslow. I also want to make sure if my students know the word hierarchy, a hierarchy is a ranking. Can you think of things that are ranked? Take a moment. Schools are ranked, the military people are ranked, royalty is ranked, and so on. So basically Maslow ranked human needs. So let's see how he ranked them. Let's consider Maslow's hierarchy. The bottom level is physiological. Please note, not psychological, but physiological, though I would happily accept biological in place of it. Things you need for your survival that you cannot compromise on. Think for a moment and think if you can think of any of these physiological needs. Go ahead. Certainly food, water, shelter, enough heat, not too much cold but also air, sleep, and so on. Maslow would include sex for the need of the species, but I would not include it for the need of the individual. One can certainly live without sex. Next, if you've met those needs, you consider safety. Think of all the things we've done today, this month, this week, to keep our safety or enhance it. Nowadays, that might well include wearing face masks and social distancing. After we've met that for the moment, you move on to love and belongingness, I do hope that you have love in your life. Belongingness is Maslow's term for our need to interact with our own kind, in other words, human beings, though a few cat ladies find that cats to be totally sufficient. A belongingness would be forming relationships, intimacies. Next, you'll notice it doesn't say self-esteem, it says esteem. Hopefully when our parents held us, literally they held us in esteem. They thought we were wonderful and cool and fantastic. We got esteem from others, and eventually we gained self-esteem too. The top one, which we never really get fully, but can take moments of it, self-actualization. Basically taking our unique set of gifts and challenges and abilities and doing the most we can with them. Basically, to borrow an old army phrase, being all that you can be. Let's take a look at the behavioristic view of personality. I hope you recognize the two theorists. Take a look and see if you do. On the left, it would be B.F. Skinner with his pigeons. And on the right, of course, John B. Watson. I don't include Pavlov here because he didn't really look at personality whatsoever. Their emphasis, well, if you remember the other name of the behavioristic approach, you got it. Do you remember? Uh, it would be the learning approach, so their emphasis would be the learned aspects of personality. And just to review, would the learned aspects be nature or nurture? Hopefully you said nurture. Now let's consider personality assessment, a fancy term for the measurement of personality. Before we can go to individual tests, we have to look at two concepts, test reliability and test validity. Think of test reliability as the consistency, or if you prefer, the repeatability of the test. Whereas validity is, does the test measure what it was designed to measure? Let me give you a very unusual and real life example of a test and have you determine if it has test reliability or test validity. Remember again that test reliability is the consistency, the repeatability of the test, whereas test validity doesn't measure what it tries to measure. About oh, 30 years ago, 
A young baby was sickly and was taken to the doctor's office. The doctor did examination and apparently came up with a hypothesis as to the child's illness. He then licked the child's forehead. And again, this is a real story. What do you think the doctor was trying to get information-wise from licking the child? Some students say the temperature. No, you could just feel the child's forehead to get the temperature. What's specific about the taste of the baby? Uh, sweetness? No, he wasn't looking at sweetness. Think of other basic tastes. Saltiness. He wanted to determine the saltiness of the baby, and very sadly, the baby was unusually salty. This baby was very, uh, later found through regular testing to have uh, cystic fibrosis, and as a very young woman of about 18 or 19 uh, did perish from this disease. Definitely a sad story. Uh, but back to our concepts, did this test, that is the doctor's lick, did it have test reliability and did it have test validity? I'll have you ponder that. Again, actually do do it. In terms of reliability, every time he would have licked the baby, he would have gotten the same degree of salt. So it was a very reliable test. Was it a valid test? Well, did it measure what he was trying to measure? That is, if the child had cystic fibrosis? Yes. It was also a valid test, though I don't think if he was still in practice, he'd be using it today. Let's consider our first test, the TAT. I ask my students to pretend it stands for tell a tale. It's a great mnemonic, but it in no way stands for tell a tale. It actually stands for thematic apperception test, but let's pretend I didn't say that and just say tell a tale. I love doing this with my students. I ask for volunteers to tell me a story of what's going on. You'd be surprised at how many different stories I get, and virtually every year I've taught, I've gotten new stories. So take a moment and see if you can construct a few stories of what you think might be going on. Common stories include death stalking a young person. I suspect I might get a lot of stories like that in the current climate. Or it might be a Snow White uh, sort of thing where the Wicked Witch plotting. The person in the foreground is designed to be very ambiguous, so some people would in, uh, interpret this person as male, others as female, to facilitate better storytelling. Other people said, tell me, it's just a nosy neighbor. Other people tell me a ghost, and I always have to ask, is it a friendly ghost or a uh, unfriendly ghost? And it depends. It might be a parent. I see this person as a grandparent, very worried about the decision that this youth that she loves is about to make. Newer stories, including stalkers, uh, the living dead wanting the brains of the living. Uh, also, stories of multiple personality disorder. So you'll be given a series of these pictures, and for each one, you'll ask to tell a tale, tell a story, and these collective stories will tell about you, your experiences, how you see reality, how you see relationships, how you see the world. I love this test. Next, we have the ink plot, but since we're people of psychology, we must know its formal name. Its formal name is the Rorschach test. So below is a picture of a Rorschach. Take a look at it and come up with as many possible things that you see as possible when you look at the image. Students commonly tell me they see masks with the face facing to the left and to the right, kind of a melty sort of mask, or maybe a moth flying downwards, or the white center, maybe something like a, a bat or a flying uh, squirrel uh, flying upwards. Some people say they see two old ladies holding hands, though to me they look like they're playing patty cake. If you look at the white between the two old ladies' heads at the top, it might look to you like a rabbit hanging upside down. You might see the ears, the head, and part of the body. So the person will see as many images as they can. The, the therapist will record it and then check the manual. The problem is that even with the manual, there are significant questions as to whether or not this test measures what it was designed to measure. Its creator, uh, Murray, had a hobby of making ink blots. What if his hobby was, I don't know, baking or crocheting? So. If psychologists question whether or not it measures what it is supposed to measure, 
are they asking about the reliability or are they asking about the in questioning the validity of the test? Take a moment and consider reliability or validity in question. So for questioning whether or not the test measures what it was designed to measure, what it's supposed to measure, we are indeed questioning the test validity. Virtually there is always a better test to be used than the Rorschach, but we just mentioned for historical reasons. Let's now consider the MMPI. I always have my students see if they can guess the P. And there are usually some good guesses. Some people say physiological or psychological, but remember our chapter, personality. The I for inventory. So this is one of the used personality inventories on the market. You absolutely positively do not know, need to know the M and the M. If you're burning with curiosity, the second M is multiphasic. The first M is one of the states, or one of the states where it, the state where it came from. If you're thinking our neighbor, uh, no, not Maine, it's uh, Minnesota. But anyway, you only need to know the P and the I, the personality and the inventory. It consists of 567 questions, which you'll answer true or false to. Obviously, you've got to fly through it and just go very quickly. It measures two things, obviously personality being one of them. The other one is mental illness. It does give suggestions on terms of where you stand in terms of certain mental illnesses based on your profile of answers. For example, if your pattern of answers is very similar to a person that's depressed, you're probably a depressed person. If your pattern of answers is very similar to somebody with schizophrenia, it might well be that you have active schizophrenia. Or if your pattern of answers is very similar to somebody with uh, antisocial personality disorder, you indeed might be a sociopath. Next, let's consider the Myers-Briggs, which is an extensively used instrument both within psychology as well as career planning and other areas. You might have indeed taken one for perhaps a sociology class or perhaps when you did career counseling. You'll see that there are four different dimensions and each one has two different possibilities, a total of 16 possible distinct personality types. Next, let's consider the NEOPI. Do you remember what PI stands for? Personality Inventory. The N and the E and the O are three of the letters from our ocean mnemonic. Try to see if you can remember what they stand for. Was the N narcissism or neuroticism? Hopefully you went with uh, neuroticism. E that was for the extroversion-introversion dimension, and O, openness to new experiences. That would almost make it suggest like it only looks at the three of five of the big five. It actually does look at all of the big five personality traits. It just emphasizes th these three the most. We've completed the slides for this chapter, but I would like to offer you the opportunity to do a few personality assessments for both self-knowledge and a bonus, though I will say the bonus practice test still remained your strongest bonus and the most useful in terms of understanding class content. Uh, you can access these three tests uh, via the links provided. If you've already done the Myers-Briggs and still have uh, access to the results, just maybe do a screenshot and send them to me. That's fine. I don't need you to do it again if you've already done it again and can prove that to me. Uh, you can do one, two, or all three. Uh, send it to me in group messages. If you use email, you'll just get the announcement asking you to resend. I hope you enjoy this activity.